I grew up there. That was the photograph, those were the photographs that I saw that shaped my creative and aesthetic kind of sensibilities. So that's where I began. And so you'll see in a lot of my work that that's still very much continues, the first floor of Founders Hall. But as I've grown as a photographer, I've become more interested in people. Um, people used to, a friend used to come to my show, shows and says, you never photograph people. I said, I don't find it interesting. I just I find the landscape more interesting than people. And this has changed in the last five years. I think it's part of my own kind of spiritual journey and photographic journey to realize that the human world and the natural world, as much as I would like to keep them apart, um, isn't going to work. And um, coming to the Mid-South um, from the West, ultimately, um, meant I had to find a way of being present in this land, in a culture with its own musical traditions, with its own racial history and the struggles of race that are part of the Mid-South that weren't played out in the same way in California. And so it was the bluesman uh, which became that place for me where I see all of the contradictions, also all of the beauty, but also all the suffering converging uh, culturally and artistically. Uh, and it's the musicians which increasingly draw my attention. Uh, often the uh, male musicians more than female musicians. There are more of them that do the blues than, than women, but there are some women who do. And I think that's connected up with an interest that I have in gender studies and how men are performing an identity um, but when they, men like him enter into their artistic identity, there can be a loosening up of our expectations of masculinity that allows this guy to suddenly look a whole lot like this guy. Uh, I put them together in the exhibit for a reason. And in some ways, men in our society are not permitted to do this. Children are, right? To smile, to lose oneself, to not be in control. And quite often, by the time we boys become men, that's been kind of beaten out of us. Mm -hmm. And that our, we're restricted in what it means to be a man because we have internalized all kinds of policing mechanisms that our society places upon us, just as it does for women. Femininity does that for men, too. And with the blues players, I always see these men breaking out of those kind of straight-jacketed identities through the creative process, they discover and get in touch with and express, I think, certain dimensions of their humanity which they're not normally allowed to express as men, especially black men, let's face it, in the South. Um, and that, that very much uh, interests me. And along those same lines, this image uh, was one that I, one of my favorites from the, from the show. These guys had just finished performing and had stepped off stage and were kind of recovering. And I moved into position, and I don't photograph with telephoto lenses for the most part. I don't, I don't like working with them. Uh, it allows me then to be a voyeur, whereas if I have a shorter lens, I have to be close. And that forces a kind of uh, participation in the scene. Um, and so I had to work very slowly to get up to these guys. And they, I watched them for about 20 minutes, waiting, and I made several exposures. And, and again, they were good exposures, but nothing special. And then suddenly the man sitting higher reached over and put his hand on the shoulder of his old friend. At that moment I knew I had the image. What grabbed me was very often in our society men are not allowed to express physical intimacy with one another. It's part of the code. It's, it's rooted in what it means to be a man. If men express too much physical intimacy to one another, we get very anxious and our kind of homophobia can kick in, or, or, or we feel threatened. Uh, if a man touches another man in ways that uh, make us uncomfortable, there are these very interesting spaces where we allow this code of masculinity to be broken. One of them's on the athletic field. <laughs> where are we slapping one another on the football field? <laughs> That's about the only place you can do that, right? But the arts are another place that allow these two older men who probably have been raised in the same straitjacket of masculinity that I have and others have where there's a kind of relaxation of that in this moment. It's a very intimate moment between these guys. Um, perfectly relaxed, perfectly comfortable with one another. Um, and I don't know if that's something that comes with age, or if it's also something that comes with the arts. Uh, having opened them and made them receptive to a new identity. And if you want to talk about theological themes, there's one.
how does participation in the arts open the imagination mm -hmm. to allow us to imagine ourselves and to perform our identities differently as a people of faith? Um, and this image for me very much kind of evoked those questions about my own masculinity and how I perform it and how it's straightjacketed in many ways. And how there are these little places in photography or for these guys in music, how they can kind of break out of those straitjackets and be more fully and authentically human. Other comments or questions or images you might ask about? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The gentleman that had the artist and had the feelings his arm, did you ask? I didn't ask. Um, when I photograph people, and this is something I'm still getting used to put back to the image you're doing up on the screen. Here it is. Um, one of the dangers of photography as an art form is that you can go at it to go out and take pictures, capture pictures, um, shoot. You'll notice that I don't tend to use that language. I talk about making photographs, not taking them. I talk about making a photograph, not shooting. The images are aggressive to paint, to capture, and to shoot. And there's a way that I think many photographers go out as though they're in stealth mode to sneak a picture of somebody. And it can be a kind of... Um, aggressive, if not a violent gesture, that I can walk up to somebody, perhaps in a moment of vulnerability, snap a picture, get my souvenir, and walk away without really having had some kind of human interaction that honors their, their humanity. That's one of the reasons I want to use shorter lenses, is that I can't snipe from 50 yards away, that I actually have to be present. And while I often don't talk to folks, I stand in a position, and I, I don't hide the camera, and, and usually I'll make eye contact and smile, and, and I indicate I've got a camera, and you can read body language, right? And this guy didn't have any problem. He, he didn't turn away from the camera, didn't shake his head no, didn't, didn't exhibit any kind of nervousness. And so there's a kind of tacit permission that can happen in that way. But there's sometimes when I get into a position that a person just doesn't want to be photographed, and I try to honor that. I just, there's plenty of other people I can photograph. This person doesn't want to participate in the creative act for reasons that are wholly his or her own, and I honor that. Um, I'm not interested in taking pictures of people who, who would experience that as an, in an aggressive way. So, so often I try to form a human connection, um, but there's also a sense in which I want to honor his otherness, and I think walking up to him and saying, hey, buddy, how'd you lose your arm? It's not exactly how to win friends and look at people. Um, I think if I came to know him, over a long period of time, and we had a, a, a friendship that would form, and if he should choose to reveal that, or our friendship could become rich enough such that I might ask it, I might ask at that time. But usually in the field, um, um, the, the level of, of friendship isn't there yet. I mean, you, you, you're on friendly terms, hopefully, but, but not a deep enough level that, that I could ask him, how did you get the wound that defines you in profound ways? It just, our relationship wasn't there, right? Um, but I did make sure that he saw me with a camera, that, that I also, my facial features say, I'm not just shooting you because you're a freak, right? You're not a freak. What I'm interested in you, I'm interested in you as an artist. I'm interested in this kind of integration of your life into these pieces of jewelry. Um, and, and so I didn't, I didn't want to photograph it outside of the context of this jewelry. And that was a way of kind of honoring that he is more than just a guy with a prosthetic arm. He's an artist who happens to have a prosthetic arm, uh, which modifies his identity as an individual artist. Okay. Well, I was this question because it's going to be maybe kind of hard. Uh, it occurs to me that this kind of thoughtfulness, um, this ability to go out to, to make these photographs, is something that we can do because we have a privilege in terms of class. Um, but at the same time, I see you choose to um, make photographs that speak to 
perhaps a loss of privilege or a regaining of privilege. Um, white race, class, ableism, etc. Can you speak to that? Is there something that, that you found in your work that kind of speaks to that? I don't know if I'm asking that well. Well, photography is not a cheap art form. Right. These lenses, these cameras require quite an investment. And so, yes, there is a, a, a all art, but certainly the kinds that require expensive resources, does come with a kind of class status and class privilege, of which I am aware. Um, but the interesting thing is, um, the best photographs and the best photographic experiences I have are when the camera becomes a way for me to enter empathetically into the life of another, even if just for a brief moment, and to delight in the life of this other. I was photographing down on Beale Street um, last spring, and there was a homeless man, uh, you know, and if you're out in, in Memphis, you, these homeless folks are out, and, and, and you know, you can expect to be panhandling in that area of town. You know, I've been down there often enough that I can see it coming a mile away, you know, the, the artificial friendliness, and the, you, you can tell they're working it up, you know. And, and I knew it was coming. He saw me with the camera, so he thought I was a tourist, and you know, I was going to fall for the shtick, you know. And um, I let him come up to me, and, and um, he went and started talking about making photographs. And, um, and I'm kind of like, okay, when are we going to get, when are we gonna get the ask? It's coming in the next two minutes for the ask, you know. And he never did. And um, so I, so I, I was there, what was the conversion? I said, would you allow me to pay you to make your photograph? And it was this really interesting inversion. I didn't make him ask. You know. And he had this, he was very interesting face. And he allowed me to, to take a photograph of him. And I gave him a few bucks. You know, and shook hands and talked a little bit about uh, politics of the day. But it was an interesting moment, I mean, because as I saw him approaching, all of my defensiveness of how I just, I hate to be panhandled. As much as I'm sympathetic to the homeless, there's something about that act that still, for me, feels kind of dirty. I don't like that, you know, it just, it, it feels a little bit awkward. You know? But how I choose to respond to that in this moment is I could have shut down, I could have just, no, not even said no, just shook my head, move on. Um, but with the camera, it, it transformed the encounter uh, so that it became something where I was able to move beyond my awkwardness and fear and engage him as a human being, not just a homeless guy. Uh, and not put him in a position of having to ask for that. Right. Yeah, I think there's a fine line between artistic um, and trying to make a statement about people who are experiencing homelessness yeah. and exploitation of the same. Yeah, it's a fine line because I think in art um, we have to be very careful with propaganda. That if, a, if an image is, if I go out to make a photograph to so that I'm advancing the cause of homeless people, or if I go out to make landscape photographs to advance the cause of ecological awareness, if there is a quid pro quo quality, it's not art, it's propaganda. Yeah. And we all, you know, sense that that good art when it's not propaganda, has multiple layers of meaning and ambiguity in an image that, that unsettles that one-to-one -one correlation between intention and meaning. And that it, it's an invitation into a scene or a, a, a moment of encounter um, that renders both you and the person or the subject that you're photographing richer and more dimensional sometimes what things to you. Um, so. well, I said, what's the story behind that? Between this, which one? This, this guy? Uh, 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 Robert Belfort. So this guy, you see the photograph of him in his suitcase here? Mm -hmm. Okay, his glory days were back in the 70s, mm -hmm. right? This is when he was kind of the, you know, the big, at the top of his game. You'll see that here in this old photograph from his record album. And he's sitting at the Blues Festival now, you know, probably 30, 40 years after this photograph was made. And um, I walked up to him, and he was like a statue. I mean, the guy didn't move. <laughs> you know? And I keep getting closer and closer and closer because I have a short lens on the camera and waiting for some kind of in interaction with him to see will he nod or will he turn away or will he kind of give me a scowl. 
And he just had this stone <laughs> look on his face like he wasn't sure whether he wanted to be photographed or not. Uh, and, and I was struck by uh, his present image with the one you know, from 30 or 40 years earlier where he's a younger man, very clearly kind of at the time as, as a performer. Uh, and these two images kind of stuck there together. And still looking at me. I mean, he he was staring down the camera. I mean, he he was not blinking. And he wanted to look right at that camera and have this photograph made. That was a very interesting. Encounter. I'm not sure there's much to say about that. I just found him very interesting. His face very interesting. Uh, the one technical failure in this photograph is I wish I'd lowered the frame a bit to get the rest of his hands in. Because I think hands are very powerful, and uh, that's just a. Next time, at next time around, you learn. Well, I guess that was kind of a, 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 an example of what makes something art. If it causes you to ask the question, what's the story? Yeah, if it causes your neighbor to ask the question. Well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Morgan's not been shy. Why did I edit out the word white? The name. And this one? Oh, why didn't I edit it out? That's a really good question, uh, because it wasn't, I, I don't think it was a conscious decision on my part. Uh, sometimes I will crop an image, you know, if something is distracting or crops me off an edge or something. And oftentimes I give myself a little more room around the edge so that I can crop. Uh, but here I didn't, because I cut, cut off his hands. Um, why I left thing there is an interesting question, I don't know. And sometimes I think, Artists don't always. Artists aren't always aware of every creative decision. Often we're working by instinct, and I, I suspect that you know, because to crop that out, I would have had to you know. That's why I was thinking that. Long. Yeah, I, that may be why I made the decision not to do it. But I could easily have cloned it out, retouched it out, and I didn't do that. I don't know why. That's a really good question. Does it? Does it? Does it, it, it so immobile. <laughs> Does it, you asked the question, is it? Well, I was thinking along the lines of what she just said. Mm -hmm. He was so still, he was so immobile until, you know, it was almost like a thing. Yeah. Or I thought maybe uh, it was referring to two things. Ah. You know, I was just trying to find yeah. a thing. Yeah, yeah, it just kind of, <laughs> yeah, it kind of became one of those little teasers in the image, right? For you. I really don't have a good answer to that question. I can't make one up on the fly either. <laughs> I don't know why it's in there. I really don't know. It's interesting to me to have one different scene. I mean, that's all I've been able to focus on since I've been under two and stuff. But I did, I did not even notice it. Mm -hmm. The photograph. That oh, interesting. Um, the other thing, as far as technical, I don't know if other people are interested in this, but I find it fascinating. So these are not pure black and white. Will you talk a little bit about yeah. the tricolor? Yeah. Um, most of my photography is digital. Um, I came to the medium when film was on its way out. I do a little bit of medium format film work, but that's very rare. Most of my stuff is digital. I photograph in color and then convert to black and white. Because the reason I do that is that you're then capable of taking each color, red, green, yellow, and blue, and you can render how dark or light that tone is separately from the other. So it gives you a great deal of creative control over which, which colors in a scene will be light, mid-tones, or shadows, right? So the photographs are converted to black and white. Uh, when, but I'm aware that when I'm going out to photograph in color, I'm actually pre-visualizing, as Anselm said. I'm visualizing, I want a black and white print at the end of this process. How do I have to photograph this scene in color to get me the raw negative that I can manipulate into that final image, right? So, um, so these are converted to black and white. You asked about the split tone. Um, straight black and white photography is just that. It's black and white and shades of gray in between. Um, there's old techniques that go back, you know, to the beginning of photography, where we realize that sometimes harsh black and gray isn't the most suitable aesthetic that if, if the grays were a little warmer, a little bit of brown in there, and so I tint the images, I add a little bit of what you might call sepia or a brown tone uh, to the image, but I don't add it to everything in the image. 
um, it's, I add it only to the shadows and to the midtones. And on the whites, I leave them pure white, so they don't look dingy, right? So the whites of this back of this, this and the piano or whatever this is, is pretty white. His shirt is pretty white. But if you look carefully at the midtones and the shadows in the image, they have a kind of a warmer brown hue to them. I find that that warms up the image, especially with, with people images. That um, I find it just a little more flattering. Um, so they're split toned. They're toned, but toned only in the shadows and mid tones, not the highlights. I'm seeing some of your color photos. I'm sorry. I've seen some of the color stuff, and your color saturation is so beautiful and stunning. And some of those photos of uh, East Tennessee are just. Mm -hmm. Thank I, you. I, I wonder. I guess maybe it's this particular presentation. Mm -hmm. I want to see more of your color. <laughs> yeah, I, I do some photography in color, and once in a while I actually find it interesting. Uh, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, I always come back to black and white. Yeah, and why that is, it's probably again having been shaped by that West Coast black and white tradition. Um, you know, I, I feel like every so often I can make a very nice color photograph, but I can't make them consistently enough to feel like. I'm not just trying to duplicate reality instead of interpreting it. And I don't know what that's about. In the back. Um, on the left hand side under the, the word thing, yeah. there's there seems to be an image back there that, that I'm picking up on. Uh, in the, the white image, like where you uh, in that area right there, it mm -hmm. seems to be like a man carrying yes. a cross. Oh. Well, there's a man, this is a reflection in a, in a shop window, a man's back and his arm right here. He doesn't have a shirt on, it looks like. Um, and then a couple of vague heads kind of reflected here. These are just, uh, looks like some, some kind of uh, glassware or something in the window of this antique store. Um, I don't see a man carrying a cross. But... Well, see, uh, if, if you move the, the corner to the right, uh, right uh, from about there over is the body, and then as you go up. Oh, here. No, no, no. Uh, right there is the head. Oh. And above that appears to be the stem of the upper part of the cross. To, to me, anyway. Mm. That's it. Actually, if you, if you, if you, this is a man's head right here. This is his back, and this is his arm. But maybe up from a distance. It doesn't, it's, some kind of but I wondered if there was any significance in relation to that and what I see over what might be the piano and the, and the picture of a man, uh, it, it seems to be like almost a flame coming up from the, above the, the top line of the piano. And, and Christ walking into the flame is, is what I envision. Mm -hmm. Well, Neil, when you say that was a poster, the word thing is on it, and uh, it's a poster behind it? It could be. Yeah. I mean, the word thing is not just hanging in the air. You've got to build something. <laughs> well, one of the interesting things about photographs is I can have intentions that I exhibit in the frame, but there are other, there's always a dimension of seeing a photograph where the viewer brings something to it and sees things that I didn't see. And that's i talked a lot today about the role that creativity in making images does in expressing and letting me explore my spirituality. But there's also a sense in which viewing other people's art is equally important. Because it opens you and asks you, you have questions, and you kind of ask, what's that about? And you inevitably see the photograph differently than I do. And it's in that kind of interesting exchange that I think the beauty of art kind of really functions. Emily? Yes. I know we're almost over, but um, the, there's a picture of one of the, I think it was a motorcycle, older mo motorcycle man with yes. a cane. Um, I just, I didn't know, I mean, it's a very... This one? Yes. Yeah. It's, it's a very, I mean, awesome picture. I just didn't know um, how how you saw this and how, I mean, what drew you to this. Well, that's a really good, I talked earlier about when you go into a scene, you have to go in kind of attuned to the world completely. And it, I find, I can't photograph with people. 
I, I, can't, I have to be alone when I photograph, I can't talk with people, because I am constantly looking, constantly scanning, constantly watching the world for these happenstance convergence of scenes that, that kind of grab my attention. And I've followed this guy. I, I'm a stalker. <laughs> um, I don't have to be. Every photographer is, uh, we're either trappers or stalkers. Sometimes we set up in a place that you know is great, and then you wait for actors to enter the stage. That's one technique we use. The other technique we use is stalking. And so this gentleman uh, is, it, you probably can't see it uh, on the screen, but his little tag here says president. He's the president of this little biker group. I watched it for a while, and it's a biker group of four guys. Three of his sons, and him. And, and I watched him, and they, had, they were treating him really well. He's obviously quite old, and they had to kind of lead him around. And he got tired, so they put him in the back of the, sit on the back of his trailer, right by a crawfish booth. And they were going to go buy him some crawfish to eat. And he sat down, and he, he, he knew I was there. I mean, I was probably 20 feet from him. Um, and it was like he knew I was there, and he almost wanted to pose for this portrait. <laughs> and he, he just planted that cane and kind of looked off into the light. And I'm like, he's just saying, take this picture, which I did. Um, and, and again, it's this very interesting moment where, where he's adorned with all of his biker regalia and his buttons and all of it. Uh, but the president, you know, but this, this, he's the president of something. Even if it's only got four members in this nation, he's the president. And uh, it was this, for me, it was this celebration of the human need to belong, the human need to be validated and valued. Um, and my photograph was one more pin on his, you know, his uh, vest, kind of. It was one more validation of who he was. And, and that was a, a kind of a rich moment to be able to do that. Let me be part of that. So. How many photographs do you take to get one? How many photographs do you take to get one? It really depends. I probably, I probably only 5%, maybe 10% of the photographs I make ever see in exhibitions. So you make a lot of mistakes. But you have to do that because it's the journey of seeing that gets you that kind of image. I mean, you look at Dorothea Lange's migrant mother. She made five or six photos as she walked up before she got it right. And photography is often like that. There's a trial and error. Yeah, one more quick question. Could right. your preference for black and white versus color go into your personal theology of right and wrong? No. No, I like lots of shades of gray. <laughs> Both my theology and my photography. Uh, no. No. Uh, no, I don't think so. I think that the black and white for me is a bit, black and white accentuates line, texture, and form. When you remove color from a scene, you're left with the elemental, basic, structural, formal dimensions of the thing. And that for me is, I think, um, what's powerful aesthetically. Uh, so no, I don't, I don't, I like color. Uh, you know, I, God made it, and I like it. Um, as, a, as an artist, reading black and white, so I, I find color too, it's too much to work with for me visually. By removing it, it kind of makes it a little easier for me to work with photographs. So. Maybe I'll grow up and someday do color photographs. Yes? Uh, it says Miller, I believe. Miller. Uh, what? Am I still selling a book? Yeah. Um, if you're interested in a photographing book of mine, yes, I do have one for sale. Uh, uh, West Coast uh, landscape images of the coastal scene. Very interested in talk. Make sure that you have um, signed the sheet to get your one hour colloquial credit. He's um, right back here. And make sure that gets left with me. And um, I want to remind you that Dr. Matthews said to us today, the arts is that place where theology gets traction. Take that with us. And thank you, Dr. Matthews.